Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode four of our Vested Finance podcast. My name is Kaihan Lin. I'm an editor at Vested, calling in from Singapore. I'm your co-host for today's session. My co-host today is Darwin Arfin, a co-founder at Vested, recording from the U.S. Welcome, Darwin. Thanks, Kai. Glad to be here again. And to our viewers, thanks for joining us again for this week's podcast. All right, let's get to it, Kai. What will we be discussing today? Great. Before we begin, the topics discussed and the opinions expressed in this podcast are purely for your information purposes, and they represent only the opinions of the individuals and not vested finance. Furthermore, the material in this podcast is not intended to be investment advice and should not be relied upon to make any investment decisions. You should consult with your own financial advisor before making any investment decisions. All right, then let's talk about specs and Microsoft and the upcoming game streaming war. Let's talk about SPAC first. Last week, we wrote about SPACs and EVs, electric vehicle companies, on our blog, and how the combination of the two might be a bubble. We initially wrote it as a cautionary tale, but I was surprised by the response that we got. People were writing back asking on how to invest in these SPACs. So I just want to take this opportunity to clarify why we think investing in these SPACs can be really, really risky. And there's a potential misalignment. Um, of incentives between the SPAC creators and the public investors. Okay, but let's start with the basics first. Let's walk through with our listeners what SPACs are. Yeah, SPACs are blank check companies. SPAC is short for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. Basically, a bunch of seasoned executives come together and working with an investment bank, they raise money from public investors, forming a company whose sole purpose is to buy another business within two years. The money they raise through this IPO process of the SPAC is then placed in a trust. So basically, it's a bank account with nominal interest. If the SPAC cannot find a company to buy after two years, then it shuts down and investors get the money back. So these executives, called SPAC sponsors, are compensated by getting 20% of the common stock of the SPAC. This means they will profit if, one, they find a good company to purchase or merge with, and two, if the resulting company becomes more valuable as the merger is successful and the new company grows over time. Oh, I see. Is there where the diverging interests between the SPAC founders and the public investor can happen? Right. What if all these SPACs, after seeing all these other SPACs buying electric vehicles, and then they see the shares pop, right? So they may optimize for funding the hot new thing rather than finding a good business to purchase. The SPAC sponsor may try to find other electric vehicles companies. They may not do a stringent due diligence in the buying process. It's just trying to serve the wave of public interest. You see this with many of the recent SPACs, actually. Just by announcing that they will be buying some previously unknown electric vehicle company, the shares of the SPAC popped. Many of these electric companies have not actually produced any vehicles as of yet. Remember that SPACs are just pools of money, right? So the value is fixed. There should not be any trading premium on a pool of cash, but the trading premium exists. This is the trend that's happening right now. SPACs are buying unproven pre-product electric companies just to see their shares popped. So in my opinion, when there's these many pre-product electric car companies merging with these many SPACs, it might be sign of a bubble. As of Q3 2020, there are 108 SPACs that have IPO'd raising more than 40 billion US dollars. That's more than the past 10 years combined. And this year alone, there were six to seven SPACs uh, and electric vehicle company merging. I think what most people are forgetting, building a car company is really, really hard. Tesla had been producing its first model, the Roadster, for two years before it went public via a traditional IPO. This was in June 2010. Now, to give you a perspective on how difficult it is to start a car company, when Tesla IPO'd, it was the first U.S. car company to successfully do so since 1956. So there was a period of like 64 years that passed where there were no successful car companies. Granted, building electric cars today is easier than building a gas car because commoditization of the parts and the supply chain, think about the windshield, the dashboard, the suspension. But most importantly, the electric motor is much simpler to develop than the internal combustion engine. The traditional gas power engine typically has more than 2,000 moving parts. The electric motor has about 100 times less moving parts than the traditional gasoline engine. With that said, though, the industry is littered with failed electric car companies. Dyson pulled the plug on its electric cars. Fisker Karma raised $2 billion before it went bankrupt. Lee Eco and many, many other electric car companies just failed to launch even their first product. 
Tesla is still the exception. All right, let's shift gears and talk about Microsoft's recent big acquisition. A couple of weeks ago, Microsoft announced that it's buying one of the most successful game publishers in the world, ZeniMax, which owns Bethesda, publisher of The Elder Scrolls, Doom, Fallout, and many others, for $7.5 billion in cash. This is the largest game acquisition in Microsoft history. What's the reason behind this acquisition? Microsoft, the answer is always cloud. But for us to understand why Microsoft made this move, we have to believe the premise that gaming is big business. A lot of folks still think that games are for children, but the reality is for a lot of people, gaming is a substitute for watching movies and TVs and therefore compete for their share of the wallet. In fact, for most people, 40 year old and younger, they prefer to play computer games than watching and streaming TV or movies, myself included. And on average, the global consumer plays about six hours of games a week. As an industry, gaming's revenue is actually larger than the entire Hollywood box office on an annual basis. Take Fortnite, for example. It's a massive free-to-play game. In 2018, Fortnite generated $2.4 billion in revenue. That's almost the same as the Avengers Endgame's box office haul. And Fortnite does this every year. You make Fortnite once, you maintain it, and every year it makes $2.4 or so billion dollars a year. Still, the crown for the highest grossing game is held by Grand Theft Auto. It sold more than 150 million units, translating to more than 7 billion in transactional revenue. That's just the, the buying of the game. But on an ongoing basis, the game continues to print cash through the, the game's online microtransaction. So the game has an online component where you can play with other people and you can buy and sell digital goods. In 2019, the Q4, the holiday season, the company Take-Two Interactives made more than $344 million in that one quarter just on digital goods, microtransactions. You can imagine that has zero marginal cost. It's almost pure profit. So gaming is real big business. And as Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix once said, Netflix competes and loses to Fortnite more than HBO or other streaming services. If you take the perspective of gaming as a substitute of TV and movies, then you can see the natural evolution of gaming is to become a streaming first global product, just as TV and movies have become. And in order for this to happen, a strong, robust cloud infrastructure is needed. That makes sense. TV movie streaming services have made the leap to the cloud. To deliver its global services, Netflix leverages Amazon's web services. Meanwhile, for its streaming service, Disney leverages Microsoft's Azure solutions. Yeah, so all these cloud providers, they're trying to do the same for gaming as they have done for TV and movie streaming. So far, gaming has largely been run locally on the different devices, whether it's mobile phones, PC, or consoles. The migration to the cloud has not really happened yet. This is due to a combination of various technical challenges. But chiefly, it's the processing power is required and then the latency because you have to have a feedback loop between the, the controls and then what happens in the game, and that has to be instantaneous. Now, for the cloud sector, gaming is still largely an untapped use case, but this is beginning to change. All of the large cloud providers have announced their subscription gaming initiatives. Google launched Stadia last week. Amazon announced Luna Plus. And compared to these other two, Microsoft's gaming effort is actually a lot more mature. Microsoft has more than 15 million subscribers of the Xbox Game Pass. And this Game Pass comes in various tiers ranging from $10 to $15 a month. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Microsoft announced the pricing for its next generation Xbox. So did Sony for its PlayStation 5. And you can tell from the pricing scheme that the two companies announced, Microsoft's strategy for the next generation is around subscription first while Sony's strategy is still hardware first, which is the same strategy that allowed it to win the previous generation's console war, where the PlayStation outsold the Xbox in a two-to-one ratio. Okay, here's Microsoft multi-tiered pricing announcement. You can purchase the console upfront or pay monthly and bundle with a Game Pass subscription. The Series S Xbox will cost upfront $300 or bundle with the highest tier Game Pass for $25 per month, which translates to a discount of $59. Series X Xbox will cost upfront $500 or bundle with the highest tier Game Pass for $35 per month, 
which translates to a discount of $19. Yeah, from this pricing scheme, you can see that Microsoft is incentivizing users to subscribe to its premium gaming service. And part of this premium gaming service is its cloud gaming service called the xCloud. This is the service that allows you to play any game, including big budget AAA games, anywhere on any device. What's likely to happen is that Microsoft will continue to make Bethesda game on other next generation platforms available for about $70 per game. So you do the traditional model of buying a disc or download at $75 per purchase. Or if you're a Microsoft's xCloud subscriber, you can subscribe for $15 a month. But then this makes your break even point about two and a half games a year. If you play more than two and a half games a year, then it's cheaper to be an xCloud subscriber. And on top of that, you have the convenience of playing AAA games from anywhere. This likely will push the hardcore gamers to be subscribers. Microsoft's goal, though, is to expand the total addressable market for its cloud business. I don't think the end game is just purely gaming revenue. Yes, the recurring gaming revenue subscription is nice, but in comparison, the cloud business generated more than $13.4 billion in the last quarter and is the fastest growing business for the company. So the cloud is about 4x larger than the gaming business in terms of revenue. Likely, Microsoft's end game is to enable all the different game publishers to build their own gaming subscription services powered by Azure. And for what it's worth, the same vision is being pursued by Amazon and Google and NVIDIA. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, that's it for today. Thank you, Darwin, for your insights. My pleasure. To our listeners, thanks for tuning in. We hope you have enjoyed listening to this episode. For more insights into markets and emerging technologies, please visit our blog at blog.vested.co.in. Until next time, take care and stay safe.